trust in your holy plan. There is one question that you can ask for, with anything, and that is, what is it for? And there's a little book that we have at the back that says, purpose is the only choice. You know, we have to realize that when we get all entangled in this world, the ego has invented many purposes. You know, what is the purpose of a cup? You know, what is the purpose of a shoe? You know, or what is the purpose of, of a microphone? What is the purpose of a phone? He even talks about what is the purpose of a telephone in the workbook. He says, you believe it's to reach someone who is not in your proximity. That's the purpose of the telephone. You believe. That's the ego's purpose for a telephone. But what's the Holy Spirit's purpose for the telephone? He says, the real question you should ask yourself is, what do I want to reach them for? What's the purpose of the phone call? You see the difference between the level of form where the ego's made up the phone. We don't have to have telephones in heaven. You know, we don't even have words in heaven. Words are but symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. But the Spirit's taking us inward and saying, what do you want to reach him for? So like when Christy was talking about the, her job and relationship and those kind of things, you know, instead of just accepting, okay, I know what the purpose of the relationship is, and I know what the purpose of the job is, in an egoic sense, um, we have to have kind of an inner dialogue with spirit and start to really honestly, deeply start to look at what are the deeper underlying purposes, which is taking us more to a purification of motive, a, a purification. You know, Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So I remember when I was in university and I was I was in grad school and I would go to Vernon Woods, this woods next to the University of Cincinnati, and I would take these long walks. And I would meditate and take these long walks and talk to Jesus. And I was in university for 10 years full time. So I was like a professional student. Uh, that's what they would say in this world, you know, undergrad and then more undergrad and then graduate school. I'm taking a walk in Vernon Woods right next to the University of Cincinnati talking to Jesus and I'm talking about it's getting kind of stressful and you know and, and master's thesis and on and on and on you know like oh, woe is me I've got a really difficult complicated life and Jesus says Jesus says what's this for what's what is this 10 years of university for and I said well it's for education he said what's all this education for and I said, well, it's to get degrees. I'm working on my second degree here. And I think at that point, I already had two. I was working toward the third one. He said, what's the purpose of a degree? I said, well, if you want to have a career, it's good to have a degree. And so I get the degree so I can have a career. And he said, what's the purpose of a career? walking along with 20 questions. Wow. <laughs> well, the purpose of a career is because I don't want to be flipping burgers at McDonald's my whole life. <laughs> I would like to have some substantial money coming in and not be getting minimum wage. And so Jesus says, uh, well, okay, what's the purpose uh, for this money to be earning? Right. I'll go with you. The reason I'm earning the money is because I want a relationship. And down here on earth, poor people aren't exactly, you know, you go out on the first date, and the date has to pay for the date, and the second date, and the third date, and what do you do for a living? I flip burgers at McDonald's, you know? Not good. I said, so there you have it. I need the education, the degrees, the, the money, the career, and everything for, for the, the relationship. He said, uh, okay, what's the purpose of the relationship? Huh. What's the purpose of the relationship? 
intimacy. <laughs> That's what the purpose of the relationship is. I want intimacy. I'm going through all this, spinning all these plates, doing all this work, and getting all stressed out because I want intimacy. And so at this point, Jesus starts talking. He goes, well, I, I said, also, I want some freedom. You know, it's like, where, no money, what if I, if I want to travel? What if I want to do things, you know? It's not everything in this world is free. It's not like heaven. It's, you have to pay. You don't have to pay to get into parks. You know, the parks are You got to pay. So I said, I want, I want to have some freedom, you know? I think the money would help out with the freedom. And I think it would help a lot with the intimacy and this and this. He said, you have every right to want freedom. You have every right to want intimacy. These are traits and qualities that you were given in your creation. God created you free. God created you with a deep sense of intimacy, deep sense of connection, love. But, you are looking for love in all the wrong places. You are looking for love in way too many faces. You are looking for your intimacy in a way that you will never find it. You are following a voice that will forever lead you on a sense of unfulfillment, abandonment, rejection, loneliness, you know, we've all had that experience, you know, that, you know, where you felt lonely in a crowd, even when you're around a lot of people, or, or at New Year's Eve and everyone's partying and, and all the noise is going and you feel melancholy or sad or lonely, even in a crowd, even with as a partner sometimes. We've had this experience where we feel extremely empty and lonely, even when we seem to have a partnership. So Jesus said, you know, you have every right to ask for that. That's your inheritance, but you are going about it completely the wrong way. And that means that all the things you've been doing to try to get the intimacy and get the freedom have a very much of a body component. In, in fact, in the Course of Miracles, if you read the Course pretty far in the text, he, he will say things like, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind, for both you cannot have, he says. For both you cannot have. That's pretty strong coming from the Master. You can't have it both ways. You have to go for freedom of the mind. You know, when you think of people like Gandhi even, Gandhi spent, Gandhi stood up for some very strong, beautiful principles. You know, Nonviolence and equality. And he was locked up. He spent quite a few of his years in jail. And uh, he actually was fine with that because he started to have the realization from spending so many years in prison that he wasn't really imprisoned in prison. Isn't that a wonderful realization? Wow. Wouldn't that be a spiritual insight if you spent years in prison and suddenly, aha, realized that you weren't in prison, in prison. And he realized that it was freedom of the mind, freedom in his consciousness, is what he really wanted. So I've been working and talking to Jesus for these years, and that started to change my perspective when I started to look at the, the schooling, and I started to look at the jobs and careers and everything. I started at that point to begin to question whether I needed all of that to have the intimacy that I wanted and the freedom. And then I went on a journey with Jesus and he said, here, I'll take you there very directly through miracles. You are designed to be a miracle worker. I am calling you out of the world. I'm calling you to be a miracle worker. But, but I, am I ready? Yes, you are ready because I will do them through you. I'm ready. I say you're ready, and you're ready. <laughs> okay. So suddenly, which I, all those 20-some years had never, you know, I, I, when I was growing up and as a child, I never heard from my parents, hey, lay, little David, you grew up to be a miracle worker. Uh, my parents weren't telling me I'd be a miracle worker. My teachers weren't telling me. My guidance counselors never told me I'd be a miracle worker. 
And then, you know, even when you get maybe later on in the course in miracles groups, your facilitator might have said, well, you're not going to be a miracle worker. You've got too, too long to go. But we can't, you know, we can't hold on to any kind of limitations because Christ is calling us to be a miracle worker and to let miracles be performed through us for our own perception, for our own expanded consciousness, our own expanded perception. And I simply started there in the woods by asking what Jesus said, ask yourself these questions, what is it for? What is it for? And I started to apply that with relationships, and now that I've had people that I've worked with for years, they start to look at their relationships, and they start to really ask the question, what is this for? Is this relationship really to maximize the healing of my mind? That's, a, that's an interesting question to ask with relationship. Is the relationship really here to maximize the healing of my mind? Or are there egoic motives that I'm trying to have this person act something out for me, or I'm trying to think that I will be much better if, I have, if I'm in a partnership for example, like when you go in to trade in a used car for a new car, why are you doing that? Why do you trade in the used car for the new car? Maybe the used car is old. Maybe it's more broken down. Maybe it's not so beautiful anymore. Why are you going into the dealership to upgrade? What if you try to do that spiritually with your relationships? What if you got a single model and you know you want a couple model? You want to go in for an upgrade. You know, I'm a lonely single model, but I think I'll trade up for a couple model, convertible. You know, and when we try to shift our self-concepts to try to cover over unworthiness and try to make ourselves feel more worthy, and we trade, we keep shifting the deck chairs of the Titanic, not realizing that the ship is sinking, and we're really trying to just get a better arrangement, you know, before the ship goes down, we have to start to realize that we really need to be asking, what is this for? When you go on a date, the ego will tell you all the things that are ticked off that you want to have, uh, the, how the date should go, and what kind of partner you want, and I see a lot of times people now are shopping for partners like they go and shop for, for meat in the grocery store or vegetables in the grocery store. They're squeezing them and they're shaking them and they're testing them out. What's the expiration date on this? If you go to the grocery store, you check out the expiration date. If you're on the first date, you say, and what do you do for a living? Uh, <laughs> Check out the expiration date on their financial. You know, it's the same thing. You might as well be squeezing the cantaloupe or something. You know, it's just, just trying to evaluate. The Holy Spirit, if you say, no, Holy Spirit, bring to me the best relationship for the healing of my mind and for the good of the whole universe, then it gets really interesting to see who shows up. <laughs> and when you get on the date, you're just going, Oh, Holy Spirit, <laughs> this is terrible. This is, I wouldn't even let this guy through the door. Uh, I, we would never have the first date if, if, if I was in charge. And I give the prayer to you, and this is what you show. This is how it works. The, the Holy Spirit is going to help you undo the ego. It's going to undo your self-concept. It's going to undo your pride. It's going to undo the things that the ego thinks you need in this world to be more worthy, more intelligence, more beauty, more something, you know, you, a better form, you know. When people get on to weight loss and so forth, they feel unworthy with a certain weight, and then they feel they'll feel better about themselves when they're at a, at a different weight. Actually, the Holy Spirit doesn't think like that. <laughs> Holy Spirit's not thinking... Oh, you'll be much more worthy of God's eyes if you lose a few pounds. That's not how the Holy Spirit thinks. It really doesn't think that way at all. The Holy Spirit loves to see mirrors come up. And when you go, oh, I hate that, and the Holy Spirit says, now let's take a look. What do they represent in your mind? You can look at that with me, and we can let it go together. Now that's how the Holy Spirit operates. So it's, it's a whole different way. I mean, if you truly invite the Holy Spirit 
into your life, into your relationships, things can get shaken up like the turkey pan uh, pretty good. And I've seen that in my life and the lives of many people I've worked with, but actually it comes out beautiful. You come out glowing and shining when you go through this purification process and just trying to cling to the old ways and try to try to go through self-improvement, you know, that's really the ego that's trying to do the self-improvement thing. Yeah. Totally, it's honestly not a flippant question, but I'm just, um, it's rather personal, but you're married. I am not. You're not? No, I, I have had a, like this band on my finger is basically I have all kinds of stories with bands because these are props to me. And so, uh, over the years, the figures have had the props on and off and everything, but it has no meaning. In fact, in other cultures, they tell me it means different things on different fingers and so on and so forth. But actually, the, this particular, I can't even remember how this one came, but I've, I've had rings given to me by women, men, uh, course inscriptions on, so on and so forth. And to me, it's just a it's a beautiful, simple symbol of no beginning and no end. So when people say married, I say married to God. Uh, because in the truth, that's where the union really is. You know, everything in this world just gets used to help us forgive the illusions that are keeping us from knowing our union with our source. So yeah, that's... I, I've, not, I've never been um, legally what the world would call married. I've been just used in purpose. Would you like to <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think life, life or one, comes into it. In that if I already am, that would be like saying to the so girl would you like to be pregnant with if she's already pregnant with That's kind of a new point. Uh, and if I'm already married in all of us, then you know, I'm not thinking I'd like to trade it in for something le a lesser model. Uh, I meant it, mean it for the experience, not for, not for the form. <laughs> This is good. This is getting, you guys are getting out of it. And this is all recorded for the whole world. Right? So we're trying to save time for the whole universe. And you guys are doing a great job of it. A fantastic job of it. No private thoughts.